I think we all realize the reason that we have dyads is you cannot do this work by yourself. I'm an emergency physician. Me, my brilliant knowledge in a black bag on a street corner, I can help, but I can't do things by myself. So we need nurses and doctors. We need radiology and ICUs. We need administrative colleagues. We need clinical colleagues. So dyads are simply a way where people can work together, take their individual skills, put them together, so the individual skills count, but the skills that we do together count even more. It gives us a common approach, a common goal, and that helps us mobilize teams within a team and across a team. And if you look at it, healthcare is one big gigantic dyad. Healthcare is the biggest industry in the United States, and healthcare is important to every single person in the United States at a clinical, family, personal job level. So we've got to take the business, we've got to take the clinical idea, the clinical approach, the clinical ethic, put them together. Dyads all the way bedside to boardroom, and we're good. One of the things we want dyads to do is make things simpler for everybody. It should be simpler for the people in the dyad, the other dyad you're working with, and most importantly, for patients and the teams themselves. Um, if you've been a nurse in the middle of the night, or a physician on call, or a patient going through five different environments in about two hours, you know that things can get pretty confusing pretty quickly. So dyads, uh, as a function and as a leadership structure, really have the capacity to make things simpler and go better. And so I like to think of it this way. If every dyad is on the same page, it helps things within the dyad, across the dyad, and for the teams. And that really boils down to keeping two things in mind. Your fundamental job as a dyad is the patient's experience in all ways, right? How easy the bill goes and were people nice to you and were things clear and all that stuff. Um, but the other, other part is to make sure that the clinical team's experience is equally the focus of your work. Now someone's going to say, well, what about HIPAA? What about compliance stuff? What about <clears throat> EMRs? All important, maybe, depending on your dyad job. But the focus, the foundation of a dyad's work is the clinical team's work and the patient's experience. And those two are related. If you're focused on those two things, away you go. Not many people in healthcare, whether you're a patient or a nurse or a doctor or a pharmacist, really feel that kind of clarity every second, every day. If your dyad can help you get there, that's a good thing. Yeah, so one of the things we know we struggle with in healthcare, everybody, at all levels, is this pace that we have. Too much to do, not enough time. And if you look at the literature on clinician burnout, one of the things that's really, really clear is that this task saturation and this constant feeling that there's not enough and this rev that we're under doesn't help us and it doesn't help us do better work. So one thing that dyads can do is take all of that fog, all of that ambiguity, and help people stay really focused. This, of course, is good for the dyads themselves. I do this, you do this, we do this together. But what it really does is it allows your clinical team to get through these very busy days with all of their forms and monitors going off and beeps and clicks and interruptions and focus on what's important and do it in a way where the work gets done well but people have a sense of resilience. They feel empowered, they know what they're doing, they know how to do it, they know how to bounce back, and they're ready to come back tomorrow with even more energy. And regardless of the work you're doing, ICU, revenue cycle, primary care clinic, that capacity to do the work well, get better at it, and come back with more energy to do it tomorrow is probably the ultimate resource in healthcare. It's good for patients, it's good for people doing the work, and allows you to do multiple things rather than be sort of caught up in this fog of too much to do, because there's a big difference. So if you were to ask the question, what is it good dyads do well? We could be here for hours, days. I mean, it's like saying, what's a good marriage or what's a good student? There are literally thousands of things. Um, I like to think of it really as three things because I'm an emergency physician and I didn't even learn the whole alphabet. So one of them is create a context that's clear. What do we really pay attention to here? This dyad, all dyads, this team. We pay attention to the patient experience. We pay attention to the clinician's experience, all of the clinicians. I assume a janitor actually is a clinician. They're part of the clinical team. So one thing dyads do really well is they create that focus around a context that's very unifying, it's very motivating, and it's very appropriate. That's number one. Number two is dyads think about and practice and spread simple rules of interaction. You cannot go walking around in a clinic or a hospital or a dyad with 422,000 things you're paying attention to. It escapes the human brain, right? A, B, C, we can remember. So one thing dyads do is they think, what are the most important ways that we interact? 
with each other, for sure, but also with everyone in our team and across teams. This really is how the body works, right? We've got millions and millions of cells, but the way they talk to each other is pretty much the same. That may be, you know, listening well, right? Taking two minutes a day to get in touch, make sure you go over your list. I mean, there are literally tons and tons of things that could be in those interaction rules, but Dyad's come up with a few interaction rules that allow things to go both ways, allow both people to be heard, both people to participate, and to stay focused on what they're doing. So simple rules that they pay attention to, they practice, and other people are like, wow, that works. I'm doing that too. The third thing is you're not a dyad once and you're done. You're a dyad again and again and again and again. So whatever your context is, that focus we talked about, whatever those simple rules are, you practice them a lot. And you practice them out in the open and you ask yourselves, how'd we do, right? If making sure everyone on the team feels heard is a valuable thing, we're gonna ask each other that as a dyad, not once a year, but once a day. And we're asking our team, do you feel heard by us? Are we listening to you as leaders, right? And do you feel that um, we're listening to each other? Can you see that? Are we actually putting those things to the test? And the more times that dyads show up, whether they're rounding or having meetings or meeting with each other, and the more times they interact with their team that way, the more that becomes, yeah, this is really who we are. It's not something we painted on the walls or we wrote down and put in a spiral binder and threw in a cabinet somewhere. It becomes alive. And those three things, context, simple interaction rules and repeating and learning again and again and again are what really good diets do all the time. I think one of the things we do sometimes in healthcare is we wait too long to act. And that makes sense, right? It takes a long time to become a cardiac surgeon. It takes a long time to get your MBA. It takes a long time to get your nurses and nursing license. But if you're really talking about being an effective dyad, the thing you can do right away is start acting. Right? Start thinking about what is your clear, compelling, inviting context, works for patients, works for the team, how are you going to interact, and start doing it. Um, it doesn't take much time to start listening, to say what are our strengths individually, what are our blind spots, or our weak spots individually, how do we put those together, and how do we make that conversation explicit and public. You can have a huddle once a day, right? You can go through your little checklist as a dyad, did we listen? Did we go listen to staff today? Did we stay focused on the patient and the clinical team? It's either yes or it's no, and the next question is how do we know, and the next question is what next? And if you just ask those three questions every day, did we get better, how do we know, and what next, you're off and running. Are you perfect? No, of course not. You know, there's a rough edge here, there's a rough edge there, but if you keep asking those questions and you ask them honestly and you listen honestly, you get better as you go. And that's a real gift, because now you're not stacking more things to do, you're doing your work and getting better as you go. So I like simplicity, I like doing it again and again, again it's the way the body works, get more done quicker. Practice. Imagine if you conducted a science experiment, and you wrote down a hypothesis, and you got out your beakers, and you wrote your methods, and you did everything really, really well, and you handed it in to your professor, your teacher in high school, and said, I did the experiment. He or she would say, no you didn't. Because there was no observation, and there was no reflection on the observing you did, and there was no conclusion. And of course we know from science, we don't do one experiment and we're done. One experiment leads to another. So dyads are the same way. If you're not listening and asking questions, and reflecting back on what happened when you tried this or that, you're really trying things and you're sort of shooting in the dark. You're thinking your action had an effect, and maybe it didn't. So in an organization I had the chance to lead, we had some really great improvements in patient safety, and we went through this little progression with a daily huddle, and at first we'd say, did we get better? And people would say, yeah. And you'd say, well, how do you know? Well, we had a meeting. Well, a meeting is like doing something, right? It's part of the science experiment, but you don't know if it had an effect until you stop and say, what happened? How do we know it worked? And what next? And that, def by definition, involves getting feedback publicly, maybe from your team, from each other, and also involves you know, more personal types of feedback, which is, I'm committed to listening to you as a dyad partner. Did you feel like I listened today? Tell me where you saw it, and tell me maybe where I was distracted, or it looked like I was not listening, I was just sort of faking it. And that gets a little bit hard to do sometimes, but good dyads do that. They do things, they ask, how well did we do? What worked, what didn't, what next? And it becomes less a personal thing, and more just about getting better. So 
In order for diets to work together well, they've got to have trust. The problem with trust, of course, is sometimes we think of it as a vague thing and we think of it as a static thing. But trust is really dynamic. I mean, you and I can make it go up right now or down right now. I can do something that undermines your trust in me. You can do something that elevates my trust in you, right? So I think one of the things to remember is that trust is key. And if you want to create it, it requires some vulnerability. Asking the question, what is it you need from me so that we can work together well? And I need to let you know what I need from you that I need so I can work together well with you. That question is really simple, but you just have to be willing to ask it. And you have to be willing also to sometimes not know the answer. Because what we need today may be a little bit different a month from now, right? I may just need to realize, if you're not of my tribe, that you actually understand me at first. And then we'll find out a little bit about what 19, 20 skills I don't even have a clue about right now, I might be thinking about a month and a half from now. So I think the key question is, what is it we need from each other? And then how do we start working in a way where we begin to understand what each other have to bring to the table? We understand maybe what our blind spots are and we're willing actually to share blind spots. Trust is related to vulnerability, not invincibility, right? So people have to be willing to say, look, I bring some things to this and there are some things I do not know. And you and I are gonna have to ask them together. Maybe we're our own answer. Maybe we have to ask someone else. Maybe there's another dyad, maybe there's a, nurse here who started working yesterday who knows what we don't and let's not be afraid to ask. So first you got to get on that same page. Second you have to have those conversations. Third you have to sort of think of yourselves as a team that creates intelligence and as you practice that you have to ask yourself is trust going up? How do we know? So if you think about this as a problem of many things moving around in let's say a beaker, right? Like it's a family practice office or it's the ORs or the pathology lab or whatever. In that beaker, that space, there are people bumping into each other. So if the dyad's doing well, the dyad's challenge really is how to mobilize as many people in that space and how to not be demobilized or held back by the ones that aren't. And so really you've got two categories of approach. One is start where there's movement already. Start where there's trust. Start where there's belief. Start where there are people working with you. And don't cut other people out, but just start there. Create gravity. Now it's not just two people, it's five people or seven people moving on this. Because we know people exert influence on each other. I may not exert influence on you, but you may exert influence on the person over there who's watching both of us. So if the two of us get moving and you contact that person and I resonate with the person that connects with me, we get some motion. And we sometimes neglect that, right? This is sort of this idea you hear, you know, don't let the naysayers slow you down. So spend the time where you can, where, where you know, the seeds you plant will grow and, and yield fruit. It's a good idea. But still you have resistance, immunization, if you will, to change or good things or whatever it is. And that immunization can be pretty dangerous, actually, to your energy, your effort, whatever. So I think the other thing to realize and learn is how to confront resistance without confronting the value or legitimacy of human being, right? Someone may have been somewhere 20 years and they're just so cynical, they're not gonna see this, that they are by definition resistant. And you can leave them alone for a while, but at some point you've gotta address them and you've gotta say, this is what we need from you, this is what we don't and won't tolerate, but this is not about what we think of you as a person. We appreciate you. People aren't used to hearing that double message, right? We appreciate you as a person, we honor you, we respect you, but behaviorally, this team is doing this. Ironically, you can see this on TV every night with sports teams. The ones that do well, do this really well. You're part of the team, individuals count, they're celebrated, they're appreciated, they have different roles, but if you don't want to play ball with a team, that's okay, go somewhere else. And in sports, it's like, yeah, well, that's business, right? And the teams that don't do this well, aren't very good and you can talk about it, and until they develop the skill and the will to deal with that, they're not gonna be any good. They may have a lot of payroll, they may have a lot of individual stars, but they're not very good. And for some reason in our healthcare environment, we're both like too polite and too disrespectful at the same time. Like we're too polite in that we don't bring it up, but when we do bring it up, we're too incendiary, right? So if all of the surgeons decide, for example, that they're gonna do pre-procedure briefs, 
and they sit down, they talk with the circulators and anesthesia and say, we think this is a good idea, and it's like, okay, great, and one surgeon doesn't, you have got to deal with that. Right away, no. You can get things moving along, but sooner or later you have to say, hey, look, where's this coming from? What's your point? Do you know something we don't? Which is possible, right? Yeah, I actually know that doing this is a bad idea, and we should learn from the deviant, because that happens too. So if it's a respectful conversation, have it. But if you dodge a conversation, you're allowing poison to spread. But you have to hear the poison too. Sometimes the poison is right. Let's stick with simple. One tip for dyads everywhere all the time is remember and act toward yourself and others that this is about how, not who. So I guarantee you I can bring some great things to a dyad. I guarantee you I can bring some mess to a dyad too. Same applies for you and anyone else. If we start worrying about who is better and add up all the good things you bring and the negative things you bring and give you a score and then go up or down on you, now we're voting and people are on the island or off. What you're always trying to do is aggregate more insight, more learning, more skill, more awareness, more action. I have a part in that. So do you. So does everyone else. So what we're really trying to do is talk about how each of us and all of us can contribute and how each of us and all of us are in the way. That's the awkward part, right? I mean, it's kind of mom and map apple pie to say, well, we all have something to contribute. Yeah, yeah, right. But we get right down to it and we realize the CEO has flaws. So does the nurse, so does the patient, so does the doctor, right? It's okay. We're not perfect, we're trying to be perfect, but let's not be afraid of talking about how we get better and how we're in each other's way, rather than who's right and who's wrong. Because who's right and who's wrong, that's war. That's civil war, it's tribal war, it's silos, we know that in healthcare, right? But how do we get better? That's a conversation that values everyone, allows everyone to get better, and frankly requires everyone to be vulnerable, right? Doctors and nurses are actually really good at this in a way, and there are ways that we're not very good at it, either as our tribe or between our tribes, and that is that at our best, we realize that every patient is worth caring for and being cared about. It doesn't matter how bad they smell or what their income level is or whether they dropped an F-bomb on you when you try to relocate their elbow or whatever it was, we see value there. And that's a good thing. So what if we did that about each of us as we worked and our conversation was about how, not about who.